We received word this afternoon that our sweet sister Margaret Teal has passed away. She passed away this morning. Her family is planning a memorial service at the Chambrell location and they're not sure exactly when that's going to be but as soon as we find the details we will pass those on to you. It is so good to see everyone this evening. As we announced this morning, we're going to probably the most misunderstood and the most misused book in all the Bible tonight, that being the book of Revelation. And remember what we're doing, we're looking at resolutions from Revelation. Now, we asked you to turn in your resolutions we received absolutely none. You probably are sitting there with some of them in your pocket. Now, we did receive before class this morning a motto for this year. Our sister Kelly McCullough, I took her off guard. She thought I was going to do something regarding a motto for this year. And listen to the one that she submitted. It certainly is good for us as a congregation and also individually. But here's what she says. Into the word we shall delve in 2012. And how true that ought to be personally and also collectively as a congregation. You remember in Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, the great book of Psalms begins by showing that how blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit at the seat of the scornful, But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in this law, he does meditate both day and night. Well, that very context captures the essence of that motto. Later on in Psalm 119 in verse 97, David says, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Now, keep this one in mind. This is the one that I would probably use if we were doing mottos tonight. But think about this, and we may mention it later on. It is so true in keeping with everything the Bible teaches and certainly the message of the book of Revelation. But notice this one, and keep in mind, as I've said, what we're looking at tonight, the book of Revelation. In Christ, all is well in 2012. If we can remember that, that to make sure that, of course, first we're in Christ, having been baptized into Christ, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away, behold, all things become new. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. But if we're in Christ, faithful to Christ, all things are well in 2012. Doesn't matter what happens this year. Doesn't matter what trials, what troubles, sorrows, or heartaches. It's going to be all right if we're faithful to Christ this year. Well, let's notice as we begin our study, resolutions from Revelation. I'm going to ask you to be turning to the book of Revelation. We're going to be getting into the second chapter. We're going to be taking our resolutions from what the Lord says to the seven congregations. And we're going to be stating all of these resolutions in the positive. But notice this as we begin. Revelation is not about troubles, but triumph. Now, I understand that there are trials. There is tribulation in the book of Revelation. We read about troubles, but that's only the beginning. Ultimately, the book is not about troubles, but it's about triumph. Really, if you want a great commentary on the book of Revelation, 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 13, remember what Paul says in that context, we're always led in triumph in Christ Jesus. And that's what the book of Revelation is all about. Notice also... Think about this. Revelation is not about death, but life. And again, having said that, we know that Antipas was a faithful martyr. He was put to death in Revelation 2 and verse 13. 
We remember in Revelation 12 and verse 11, the way they overcame is because they did not love their life even to death. So we're not saying the book doesn't speak about death, but what we're saying is, again, ultimately, Revelation is not about death. It is about life. You remember in Revelation 1 and verse 18, Jesus said, I am the living one, and I was dead, and now I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. And so Jesus said, I was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore. And isn't it interesting, as you read through the book of Revelation, everything associated with our Lord speaks of life. In chapter 2 and verse 7, speaking to the church at Ephesus, he speaks of the tree of life. In Revelation 2 and verse 10, to the congregation of Smyrna, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And so the tree of life, the crown of life. In Revelation 3 and verse 5, the church at Sardis, their names would not be blotted out of the book of life. Later on in Revelation 22 and verse 17, when the great invitation is extended to all mankind to partake of the water of life freely. And so many things in the book of Revelation. Tree of life, crown of life, book of life, water of life. The book of Revelation is not about death, but about life. And also think about this, Revelation is not about obstacles, but overcoming. To every congregation in chapters 2 and 3, Jesus will speak to them about overcoming. And that's so fitting. Remember in John the 16th chapter in verse 33, Jesus said, In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good courage, for I have overcome the world. That, my friend, is how Jesus is depicted in the book of Revelation. Not as a victim, but one who's victorious, as a conqueror, as one who has overcome. In fact, in Revelation 5 and verse 5, John is weeping because nobody, nobody came forth to take the book from him who sits upon the throne. But then it says, stop weeping. One of the elders tells John, stop weeping. The lion from the tribe of Judah, the new King James says, he has prevailed. Other translations say he has overcome so as to take the book and open the seals. And so, again, it's not about obstacles. It's about overcoming. I've already mentioned in Revelation 12 and verse 11, after a very forceful depiction concerning our enemy, as the old serpent, the dragon, the accuser of our brethren, it goes right on to say, they overcame him. They overcame Satan because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the word of their testimony, and because they did not love their life even to death. In fact, listen to the first part of Revelation 21 and verse 7. Keep this in mind because even though each congregation is promised something if they overcome, the reality is if we overcome, we receive that in everything else that's promised to every congregation. In Revelation 21 and verse 7, He who overcomes shall inherit all things. Read the book of Revelation with that in mind. The promises to the one who overcomes, and he who overcomes shall inherit all things. Well, notice also, Revelation begins with an affirmation of Christ's love and ends with an invitation for all to come. In Revelation 1 and verse 5, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. He loves mankind. He gave himself. Remember John 15 and verse 13? Greater love has no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. So it begins with an affirmation of Christ's love and ends with an invitation.
for all to come to Jesus. Well, as we continue, here's a verse, Revelation 7 and verse 10. And it's so interesting, every time, if you're like me, every time you read the Bible, new verses seem to jump out at you. I've always had favorite verses from the book of Revelation, and I wonder how I've missed this one so often. If you want to know what the book of Revelation is about, here's what it's about. It's about four things. It's about salvation. It's about God. It's about the throne. It's about the Lamb. And notice what John says here in Revelation 7 and verse 10. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. I want you to notice that unity there. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. There'll be another verse later that will say expressly the same thing. That we're talking about the Father, we're talking about the Son. We're talking about the one who sits upon the throne, we're talking about the Lamb. But notice that. Salvation, God, the throne, and the Lamb. Salvation. You remember what Jonah said in the belly of the whale? Sad that it took the belly of the whale for Jonah to remember this, but salvation is of the Lord. That's exactly what we read here in the book of Revelation. And not only is salvation of the Lord, but it is so great salvation. Hebrews 2 and verse 3. In Psalm 70 and verse 4, Let all those who seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. And let all those who love thy salvation say continually, Let God be magnified. The book of Revelation is about salvation, but the book of Revelation is about God. We're not going to turn to all of these verses, maybe to a couple of them, but did you listen as the scripture was read tonight? Cooper read Revelation 1, verses 1 through 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, but as you begin the book, remember it's about salvation, it's about God. God gave Christ that revelation. Later on in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, we see our Father seated upon the throne. Remember there's that open door? And as John looks in, he sees a throne. But it's not an empty throne. It's not a vacant throne. There is one seated upon that throne. How grateful we ought to be. How thankful our brethren must have been in the first century to hear that. The throne is not in Rome. The throne is in heaven, ultimately. And so there is a throne, and there's one seated upon it. Make no mistake about it, as you continue to read chapter 4, it's our God who's seated upon that throne. In chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, when that fifth seal is open, the martyred saints, those who are beheaded, they want to know how long, O Lord, holy and true, wilt thou refrain from avenging those who have taken our blood. They want to know that, but they're praying to God. They want to know how long. In chapter 18, it's going to be answered. In one hour, such desolation is going to come. For the Lord God is strong. We see why this is taking place. Turn, if you will, to Revelation 18 and verse 20. Notice what this says, and this really is one of the important verses in the book of Revelation. As you know, they're all important, but remember what they want to know. How long before you're going to avenge our blood on those who dwell upon the earth? Well, look at chapter 18. Chapter 18 is about that. It's about the destruction, the fall of Babylon. And look what it says in chapter 18 and verse 20. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, now listen to this, for God has avenged you on her. How long before you avenge our blood? 
In chapter 6, he says it's going to be a little while longer. He encourages them to be patient, but he avenges them on her. Look at chapter 19 and verse 1. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, now listen to what that voice in heaven, that great multitude is saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Look at verse 6 of this same context. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunder saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. You know, really, there it is again. The Lord God omnipotent. It's about God. And as we'll notice in a moment, it's about His throne. He is omnipotent. He is seated still upon that throne in heaven. It's interesting, these last two verses, chapter 19 and verse 10, and also chapter 22 and verse 9, these are two incidents when John has been given a magnificent vision. It is so wonderful, it's so powerful, he falls at the feet of the angel who delivered it. And remember what the angel tells him, get up. I'm a fellow servant like you. But the point each time is very simple. It's comprised of two words, worship God. That's what the angel says, don't worship me. Don't get all caught up in the messenger. Worship God. The book of Revelation is about salvation. The book of Revelation is about our God. Also, it's about the throne. As Revelation 7 and verse 10 says, think about this, the throne is a symbol. Remember, the book of Revelation is a symbolic book. It is a figurative book. This is not a literal throne, but the throne stands for something. And what it stands for is authority and sovereignty. Remember what we read? The Lord God omnipotent reigns. Chapter 19 and verse 6. That's exactly what the throne should convey to our minds. Our Lord God, the omnipotent one, the sovereign one, the one with authority, He rules, He reigns in the kingdoms of men. Daniel 4 and verse 25. Go to chapters 4 and 5 of the book of Revelation. And 17 times in those two chapters you're going to be reading about the throne. It's a prominent symbol. It means that God has all authority. It means that He is the sovereign one. Sovereignty means He has the right to act. And he's going to act in the book of Revelation on behalf of his church, on behalf of his saints. He's going to avenge their blood on those who dwell upon the earth. Well, it's about salvation. It's about God. It's about the throne. It's about the Lamb. And once again, remember in this figurative book, that Lamb is Jesus the Christ. In John 14 and verse 1, now think about this verse, because if you want a bridge between Revelation 4 and Revelation 5, here it is. Revelation 4 is all about the Father seated upon the throne. Revelation 5 is all about Jesus, and at the end of it, He's seated upon the throne with His Father. But remember what Jesus said in John 14, 1? You believe in God, believe also in Me. Well, Revelation 4 is you believe in God. Revelation 5 is believe also in me. In John 1 and verse 29, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Revelation 5, verses 5 and 6, we've already mentioned verse 5, He has prevailed that lion from the tribe of Judah he has prevailed, he has overcome so as to take the book and loose its, its seals. But in verse 6, when John goes to look at this lamb, remember what he sees? He sees a, li a lamb, not a lion. He sees a lamb standing as if slain. 
And this lamb has redeemed us. Remember, he's redeemed us by his blood. In Revelation 7 and verse 14, it talks about those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. In Revelation 1 and verse 5, remember to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. So when you look at the book of Revelation, keep in mind that this book, it's about salvation. It's about God. It's about the throne. It's about the Lamb. Worthy indeed is the Lamb. Well, let's notice this now. We're just going to look at three resolutions tonight. Next Sunday night, we'll complete the final four. But notice, we put down here seven resolutions from Revelation. Here's the first one. I will maintain my first love. Remember what we're saying. We're stating all of these resolutions in the positive. This was the problem in the church at Ephesus. In Revelation 2, read with me verses 1 through 4. Revelation 2, let's look together at verses 1 through 4. Jesus begins writing to each one of these seven congregations, seven, once again, that wonderful number which really is depicting the entire church. But look at this, Revelation 2 verses 1 through 4. To the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Stop there. What compliments? It's interesting in these letters when Jesus can commend a congregation, he's going to do it. When he can compliment them, he is going to compliment his brethren. And so after all of this in their favor, notice what he says in verse 4, Nevertheless, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. What's the resolution from this stated in the positive? I will retain my first love. Each and every one of us as we have entered this year, this has to be first. It has to be foremost on our minds, in our hearts. This year, we're going to maintain our first love. Now, think about this. In Acts 19, verses 17 through 20, I think here's probably the best example of first love that you can find. Now, remember, Jesus is writing to the church at Ephesus, in Acts 19, that's where Paul is. He's in Ephesus. He's preaching. And remember what happens after the sons of Sceva, the exorcists, try to remove the demon. They say, Jesus we know, Paul we know, but who are you? And they beat those seven sons of Sceva. Well, after that, something happens. The name of the Lord is magnified. His word is going to grow in Ephesus. But those who practice magic arts, they brought their books together and burned them. Go back and read this context. See the sum of all of those books, what it cost. Remember now, Jesus tells the church at Ephesus, you've left your first love. First love is indicative of zeal. It's indicative of intensity. We find in Acts 19 how intense their love was at first. Nothing would stop them from serving the Lord. Nothing would hinder them. Even that which they practiced all of their life would be sacrificed for the cause of Christ. That's first love. That's an intense love. That is a fervent, zealous love. But something's happened now in Ephesus. And Jesus said, you've left that intensity. 
you have left that first love. Well, notice this, some verses. Do you remember Matthew 24 and verse 12? When lawlessness is increased, the love of many will grow cold. The latter part of that verse is exactly what happened to the church at Ephesus. Their love had grown cold. The term fervent or zealous in the Greek, it means hot. It means boiling over. Their love was no longer fervent. It wasn't boiling over. Their love had grown cold. Jesus says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You've left your first love. In 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 17, Come out from among them, be ye separate. Thus saith the Lord, Touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. Well, evidently they've mingled with the world just enough that their love has grown cold. In Revelation 18 and verse 4, again, the sentiment there is, Come out from among her, you who are my people. Don't receive of her plagues. Don't participate in her sins. That's what happens when we leave the intensity of first love. So the resolution from the church at Ephesus, I will maintain my first love. But notice this. 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 12. And let's at least turn to this one verse. You'll see why in a moment. I'm really not saying let's just maintain first love. I'm convinced that as Christians, wherever we begin in our love, and it should be an immense love that brings us to Christ. We love because He first loved us. 1 John 4 and verse 19. But we're not talking about simply maintaining that love. We are talking about growing in it. We're talking about increasing and abounding in our love. This is what we're going to read in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 12 about the love of brethren. We just don't maintain a love for each other. That love grows. That love increases. That love abounds. Listen to this. 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 12. It says, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you. So please don't let my word maintain fool you. Now we're not simply talking about maintaining first love. That love that brought us to Christ needs to increase. It needs to abound. You remember what we said a few weeks ago? The interesting thing about love in Galatians 5 and verse 22, we have the list of the fruit of the Spirit. And love begins that list. But in 2 Peter 1 and verse 7, love concludes the list. It's at the end of the list for the seven graces that you'll find in that context. And then in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 11, when Paul is writing about certain things, love is about in the middle of that list. And so in our lives, love for God, love for each other, our brethren, it should be first, it should be last, and it should be everywhere in between. I will maintain, and not only maintain, but increase and abound in first love, our love for Christ. Well, notice the next thought. I will be faithful unto death. Look at Revelation, the second chapter. This second congregation, the church at Smyrna, we're going to be reading chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Notice this. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. 
What a great promise here. Be faithful unto death, and remember now the one who says, I'll give you the crown of life. He was dead, but now he's alive forevermore, and he has the keys of death and of Hades. It's that one, Jesus Christ, the lamb slain, who says, you just concentrate on being faithful. You be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Of life. There's life again. Remember, the book of Revelation is not about death. It's all about life in Christ Jesus. Well, look at this. How? When I ask that question, how? How are we going to be faithful unto death? Everything that we face in this life, Satan, his schemes, his wiles, those temptations, the trials, the sorrows, the persecution. Remember, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 12. How are we going to be faithful? Well, there's one answer to that. It's what we just talked about. When we maintain and abound and increase in love. Love is what's going to allow us to be faithful in this life, even to death. You remember in 1 John 5 and verse 3, this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. You see, we're not going to burden ourselves as we go through life keeping God's will, doing His commandments. That's not going to make us weary. Remember in Genesis 29 and verse 20 what is said about Jacob? He worked seven years for Rachel. They seemed but a few days because of his love for her. Every faithful child of God can identify with that. Whatever we're called upon to endure in this life, it seems like nothing. Romans 8 and verse 18, I reckon the sufferings of this present life, they're not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed. How can we say that? Because of love. And also in Song of Solomon 8 and verse 7, many waters cannot quench love, nor can rivers overflow it. Those waters, those rivers, indicative of problems, trials, troubles, sorrows, Many troubles will not overwhelm love, nor will many problems overflow it. Love will conquer. Love will be true to every test it faces. Again, I'll be faithful unto death. Numbers 23 and verse 10. Remember what Balaam said? Let me die the death of the upright, and let my end be like his. As we mentioned a moment ago, we received word about our Margaret passing from this life. She died the death of the upright. There's something to be said about that. We're all going to die. We're all going to pass from this life. And the world, when they are in their right mind, they look at the death of the upright and they say, that's the death that I want to experience, just like Balaam. Let me die that death. Let me die like the upright. Let my end be like his. Again, to die the death of the upright, you have to live the life of the upright. Oh, it's right, it's good to desire that end. Because in Psalm 116 and verse 15, remember what God says? Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. Everyone should desire to die the death of the upright but we have to tie life with death. We're not going to live outside of Christ and somehow die in Him. We're not going to live unrighteously and die righteously. If we want to die the death of the upright, let's live the life of the upright. But again, this resolution, I will be faithful unto death. Revelation 14, 13, right from now on. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They shall rest from their labors, and their works follow after them. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1, For we know if this earthly tent, which is our house, be torn down, 
we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In Hebrews 11 and verse 16, speaking of all the faithful that Hebrews 11 enumerates, it says they desired a better country, that is, an heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, and he's prepared a city for them. I will maintain my first love. I will be faithful unto death. These are resolutions from Revelation. The last one tonight, I will cling to Christ and abide in his doctrine. Look at the next letter. It's going to be written to the church at Pergamum. And look what it says in chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. We're going to read through verse 15. Listen to what this says. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp edge, to, uh, the sharp edge sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate." Now again, we're stating all of this in the positive. Jesus is rebuking the congregation in Pergamos. They weren't holding to him like they should. They were not abiding in his doctrine as they ought. But we're talking about a resolution for this year. This is what we're going to do. We're going to cling to Christ. We're going to abide in his doctrine. Remember Matthew 6 and verse 24? No man can serve two masters. He'll either love the one and hate the other, or be loyal to one and despise the other. That term loyal in the New King James, the King James in the New American Standard says hold to. He'll either hate the one and love the other, hold to the one and despise the other. It's talking about clinging. We're talking about clinging to Christ as the apostles did. In John 6, when many withdrew and were following him no more, Jesus gave them the same option. Will you also go away? Peter said to Lord, whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. What's he saying? I'm clinging to you. I'm holding on to you. You're the only one that has the words of eternal life. You remember in John 15, verses 1 and following, what's it all about? It's about Jesus as the vine and ourselves as the branches, just as the branches cling to the vine. So also we need to be clinging to Christ. Again, I will cling to Christ and abide in His doctrine. Doctrine means teaching. Don't let anyone try to fool you about this word doctrine. There are those, of course, who want to emphasize that, well, we just need to worry about the heart. And let's stop worrying about doctrine. In fact, notice this. There are those who say doctrine doesn't matter. You probably talk to friends, co-workers, and that's what they've said. They don't understand, as we've just mentioned, doctrine means teaching. Are they really saying that teaching doesn't matter? They'll say that about doctrine because that seems like a formal word, like some big word, like we're not supposed to be worried about doctrine. Well, so they say doctrine doesn't matter. Here's the sad reality. It doesn't matter to them. It should. But when they say doctrine doesn't matter, they're speaking at least a half-truth. Because as far as they're concerned, as far as their life is concerned, doctrine really doesn't matter to them. But biblically, doctrine matters. 
In 1 Timothy 1 and verse 6, when Paul left Timothy in Ephesus, it was for a specific purpose, to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Why didn't Paul say, hey, I know there's a lot of teaching going on there, but Timothy, just keep this in mind now. Teaching, doctrine, doesn't matter. Oh, it matters. Teach no other doctrine. If any man goes too far and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, he is not the Father. But if any man abides in the doctrine, he is both the Father and the Son. 2 John verse 9 sounds like doctrine matters. If you don't think doctrine matters, then again, based upon that verse, you're willing to give up your relationship to the Father and to the Son. Because if we're not abiding in the doctrine, we have not the Father. But notice this. If doctrine really doesn't matter, then the following is true. Now listen to these verses. I've tried to group them together. Acts 2 and verse 42 with Revelation 2, verses 14 and 15. Likewise, Titus 2 with Hebrews 13 and verse 9. And also Acts 13 and verse 12 with 1 Timothy uh, 4 and verse 1. I put them together for a reason. I want you to think with me as we conclude tonight. If doctrine doesn't matter, then here's the reality. Acts 2 and verse 42 speaks of the apostles' doctrine. But if doctrine doesn't matter, the apostles' doctrine is no better, it's no worse than what we just read about, the doctrine of Balaam or the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now let me ask you a question. Who is going to contend such? Even those who say doctrine doesn't matter, if we somehow could get them to think, Really? If doctrine doesn't matter, then there's no difference between the apostles' doctrine and the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, Jesus said. You see, there are some doctrines that Jesus hates. There's no getting around it. If doctrine doesn't matter, this second one, Titus 2 and verse 1, speaks of sound doctrine. But Hebrews 13 and verse 9 speaks of strange doctrine doctrine. But guess what? If doctrine doesn't matter, sound doctrine is no better than strange doctrine. You just pick what you want. You want sound doctrine? You want strange doctrine? After all, it doesn't matter. Nonsense. It matters if our relationship to our Father and His beloved Son matters. This last one, Acts 13 and verse 12, speaks concerning the doctrine of the Lord. 1 Timothy 4 in verse 1 speaks of doctrines of demons. If doctrine doesn't matter, then we're going to have to say the doctrine of the Lord is no better than the doctrine of demons. Again, no one, no one who seeks to please our Heavenly Father would ever say that. Yet on a daily basis, that's what man foolishly espouses. Doctrine doesn't matter. Yes, it does. If any man goes too far and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, he has not the Father. If any man abides in the doctrine, he has both the Father and the Son. What resolutions did we look at tonight? Well, I will maintain my first love. From the church at Ephesus, they weren't doing it, but we need to be all about that. Not only maintain, but increase and abound in that first love. I will be faithful unto death. The church in Smyrna was striving to do just that for all the right reasons. And notice this last one. I will cling to Christ and abide in His doctrine. If we abide in his doctrine, Jesus said, you are my disciples indeed. John 8 and verse 31. Be reading, if you will, through the rest of those letters to those seven congregations. Let's see what we can find by way of resolutions, applying what Jesus said to them to our own lives 
and seek to have the very best year we've ever had in Christ Jesus as an individual and as a congregation. Tonight, let's start this new year as all of us should in fellowship with the Christ. If you're outside of Christ, you've never obeyed His commandments, you know what to do to be saved, then why don't you come tonight willing and ready to do that. As a brother or sister in Christ, if you've not been living faithful, let's change that. You can do that tonight while we stand together and while we sing.